Go again, Is. Now you don't never die. Hi everybody! Hello, Mallory. Hey. hey. Woo! That's awesome. <laughs> I am a patron, obviously. Um, I've been listening to God Academy now for about a year and a half, and I was just really brought in by all the academics and kind of like the applicative theory that you bring to Game of Thrones, and I really enjoyed like the the blending of it and. Um, it kind of really fits into what I do, um, which is linguistics. I do uh, ESL studies and applied linguistics at Georgia State University. So, so just like in general, how do you apply that knowledge and uh, your this passion into Game of Thrones, the universe? Where where do you see that? How does that correlate? Well, you can do it in like two ways. So the way that I've divided up, one is uh, the. I guess like a funner way, which is you actually like explore the world in terms of linguistics. So you're talking about like what is Westerosi or, or SOC and culture like? What is their sociology like? What are the conditions necessary to create language development in this world? So there are all kinds of different languages in Essos. Mm -hmm. In Westeros, there's common tongue. Yeah. No. Which is also known as English. English, yeah. English. It's actually interesting that you say that because in interviews, George R. R. Martin, uh, he's explicitly stated that common tongue is not English. But here's a here's a real uh, linguistic paradox: is that how can you know if something is not English if you're reading it in English? You know, it's kind of like can your mind like come up with what that language is supposed to be? What does it mean that it's not English? What is it then? I don't know. Like that's a it's such, that's what makes it such an interesting question is that like that's where the sociology would come into play and that's where we would have to kind of be helpful with other fields and have to go into something like psycholinguistics or you know sociolinguistics. You would have to use these other fields to kind of bolster your own uh, research and I think like if you wanted to explore kind of what the common tongue like is you know you would have to like start small i've been very busy there's no um a priori like text for it there's no moment where aria george r. r martin himself like writes in the common tongue there's there's no instance of that not yet maybe maybe we'll have somebody really smart develop uh real common tongue you know i think that he's that he's wrong if i dare say so sorry oh, george boy, if you're listening he, Ooh. <laughs> he is wrong he is wrong and why, <laughs> and why it is english is because he has in his uh, in his books all kinds of instances where he uses languages that are not english right that are from french or from italian right or de or, or derived from real human history and actually, I don't like it when it like I think there's the words uh, the word uh, piazza and there's like a word that comes from French. I don't remember which one now off the top of my head. And there he exposes the fact that it is English and that English sometimes has French words. Yes. <laughs> in in this world, there is no French. Right. There is no Italian. No. That word would would, would not exist. And there's none of the systems that exist with that. But I think that's what's so interesting and like why you could make a case why common tongue is just really English is because um, you have kind of like the same sociological factors as exist in our world for something like English to exist. So and yeah. plus too, like we just like I explain, like I elaborate a little bit about that, about the, the sociological factors that uh, create a language. What you're exposed to as a child, it has just an insurmountable effect on how you will not just process language but process your experience and like linguists believe or they argue over how these two things happen it's that your native language is kind of hardwired into you everybody's right. born with this lad now what he chomsky he chomsky yeah the bigger he the, the big he the big he <laughs> But but even he says he's wrong. So God, you know, oh. like we can we can kind of poke fun at Chomsky a little bit. So Chomsky believed that we are not these tabula rasas, that we're not these blank slates. Humans are hardwired to just soak up any information and dissect and dichotomize by like it's just what we do. We just naturally decode things. Now, where linguists argue is. 
are the processes for native language the same as how you will learn a second language is grammar. So you're innately going to learn your first one by psychological behaviors. You're going to mimic, you're going to imitate, you know, you're going to cry for things that you want. And then the person, your caregiver, you know, your, your provider, you know, responds yeah. to it and you build off of it. And then this is how interactions start. Most overwhelmingly people learn language without training. I mean, if you simply immerse a child in a situation in which language is spoken, he acquires this system. I mean, every child is capable of uh, understanding and producing very complex structures which have no simple relationship, no point-by-point -point relationship, no, uh, no, no relationship on the basis of analogy, let's say. Where linguists are concerned, I think the big argument with them is that some see the process as one and the same, that we learn L1 and L2 the same way. Others believe that we learn it by two separate processes. And some believe that it's actually a blend, that we start out separate, but we come in towards the one. And I think that's really interesting in terms, if we think about this in the context of like the, the fantasy like world of Westeros and Essos, okay. like if you can see it from kind of like this Vygotskyan meld of the the social interaction and the grammar that you're remembering then it, it kind of makes poetic sense because you would have um characters who they're starting out as like two separate people for instance like Arya is no one then she's the stark eventually the two have to reconcile i think okay. a lot of languages can be attributed to that kind of journey too so it, it just it Thematically, I, I'm not saying like it could work like, oh, like, you know, this is it. But I'm just saying it's yeah. a it's a nice like little flair that that's there in the characters. Right. Also, maybe Daenerys, right? She's Valyrian. Right. She, she speaks the common tongue. Which which is she most? Is she most more Westerosi, more Targaryen, Valyrian? Thank you, sir. Are you from my country? I think, like, for all intents and purposes, I would ascribe Daenerys Targaryen as a native Valyrian. She wasn't even really born in the holdfast of Westeros. She's born on Dragonstone. Yeah. She's whisked away. But then again, like, if I think about it, too, there's a phenomenon in linguistics called, like, language isolation. And a lot of, like, what happened under Aegon's conquest and fire and blood could be an interesting exploration into that whole side. Daenerys is such an interesting topic to me. Like, I think she would be, yeah, she's like a linguist's dream. She's like, whoa. Right, because she learned the common tongue even though she lived in a place where that's not the common tongue pardon the pun it, and she grew up in a place too where it's like debated some people think that she grew up in bravo so she would be speaking bravosi but then other people think that you know she grew up in pinto so she'd be speaking pinto she the point is is that her and viserys would be speaking three four five languages at a time like right. constantly juggling it like miss you know and having to deal with that <laughs> you are from Essos. Where? Lise. I have an ear for accents. I've lost my accent entirely. I have an ear for that as well. <laughs> and it really sets up like this whole big split between why she's so successful in Westeros. Or sorry, why she's so successful in Essos, yes. In the show, not not in the books. She's not doing yeah. too hot in the books. Um, <laughs> um and then like like her complete and utter failure in Westeros. And I think a large part of that is, is that like one, if we can just get past like the reaction of just like, it's just kind of clumsy writing, but if you can get right. kind of more into the meat of it, then I think like Daenerys's failings is her failure to, to integrate the Westerosi part of her into her Valyrian self in a sense. Does that, I don't know if that like is so great. Yeah. No, no, it makes super sense thematically, character-wise, and also from a, like, 
psychologically yeah. and also from a linguistic perspective. Definitely, definitely. She brings over also politically things that are not needed in Westeros, right? She, like her whole Essosian identity, and which is kind of anti-Valyrian in some sense, right? She wants to break uh, the chains, the breaker of chains, the chains that the Valyrians uh, have initially put. And then she's bringing that over to Westeros where people, uh, there's no uh, buyers for that kind of... Uh... What is a chain? What is chain? Yeah. What is it? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that concept is not, uh, doesn't uh, resonate. So it fits like in all kinds of different ways. It makes me think of a really like, it's one of my favorite Russian history. And it's one of like billions that I know because I'm a huge nerd for Russian history. But... Um, one of it is Peter the Great went on his, you know, beautiful European tour and then he comes back to Russia and he's like, I've been all over the world and we're backwards AF and we've got to clean it up right now. So I want every farmer out here to build me one boat for my Amarada and they, you know, and I want everybody to cut their beards and stop putting bombs and logs and like they went out and they were telling the peasants all this and they're like, okay, the, the czar wants you to build a boat. And you're in this landlocked country. Yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> what's a boat? You're going to need a bigger boat. What's a boat? Yeah, what? What is that? So I like thinking about it in terms of like, yes, we have these big overarching kind of like what the finale was talking about of who has the decision. You have these like monolithic characters like Daenerys who have choices and have an identity. But I think it just goes to show that people like the small folk are, are just really kind of like brushed aside, but they really shouldn't have been. I think all the time, like you're supposed to always try to consider it. Cause um, one of the, the criticisms that I got about it was why couldn't Daenerys have really like reached out and like gotten to the people of King's Landing, you know, and it's like, yeah. well, in order for that to happen, you know, you would have to have certain parameters be met linguistically speaking you know you would have to have kind of like i don't i don't know i think all forms of language interaction involve some form of oppressed oppress you know the oppressed the oppressor dichotomy okay. so it's always going to like turn around i've always hmm. thought that like an interesting way for the story that one way that it could have gone was that it was about the development of the small peoples like kind of like a magna carta this emergence of yeah a man of the people who does Cersei's dirty work for her. The people always do the dirty work. The father judges us all. Sons of high lords, sons of fishermen. If you break his laws, you will be punished. That, that was before Cersei blew up the sept. <laughs> like, I, I just keep on like thinking of all these like great, like long plays, like just forever that you could just show the, the progress of time through. And then it's like, no, 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 we're just gonna, we're just gonna blow it up. All right, cool. But it doesn't have to be linear. No. You know, you could have like whatever, a crater and then move on. But you know what? Now, now that you're talking about it, it makes me think. So I'm not sure how much, I don't, don't know how much credit I want to give the But let's say the Unsullied, they are the oppressed, who become the oppressor. Right. And her speaking Valyrian uh, in Wester in, in the capital of Westeros, right. she's basically speaking Valyrian, a foreign tongue to the people who Why do you think everybody's people, like yeah, they're like they're everyone's like looking around, they're just like, What is she saying? Yeah, like, I don't know right. what this is. I haven't heard this in like two hundred years, dude. Right, but it doesn't sound good. No, not at all. Good. She's got a dragon with her, she's talking to the dragon, she can speak parcel tongue, it's not fun. Like Ooh, uh, yeah. Parcel tongue, that's another yeah. thing. Well, ah, yeah, yeah. One, one thing I got into about, um, and, and we'd have to make a distinction in it, is that in linguistics there's a really fine line between human communication language and animal communication, which is, I think oftentimes people are, are drawn to mammals like, we want to identify with things, even if, if they're not like us, we always want to try and like include others in our process, you know? Okay. So, I think sometimes we mistake and we're like, oh, like if we can teach an ape sign language, they can produce sign language and they can speak, you know, but that's not what's going on. The process between what happens with the person when you teach them that and when you teach an, an animal that is that an animal is only going to remember that pattern within that set 
very limited kind of box of what you want them to do. But a human, we're a bit different. We can pull from past knowledge. We can, you know, try new combinations. We can produce new utterances. Animals can't really right. do this in right. a sense. Like, you can see that with kids. Kids try to invent new words based on stuff right. on things that they know. Right. And so I I think all the time too that like George R. R. Martin plays a really fun dance, if you will, between this relationship of language versus communication. And you'll see often that like before the characters have to make this intense like character changing moment uh, in the books at least they'll have these dreams and they're just like you know plagued with them but they're imagining that they're the animal and that like you know they don't have right. to communicate that they can just take and like it's that warging that's that's so intoxicating it's like the the lack of language like the the desire you know the complete surrender to this like other kind of dimension of of being in a way we all kind of wish that we were a little bit like you know the the animals that we're trying to teach yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so like, chomsky wrote the, all of this in the 60s and he came up with this concept of language acquisition that humans can acquire it later on uh Krashen develops these five hypotheses of a describing that these could be two separate processes and these who is he krashen mm -hmm. is a I, like i, I believe american he, also i think he is yes I, okay. I i didn't look that up i'm sorry i'm just super lazy <laughs> okay. that way but um sorry <laughs> krashen forgive me but um <laughs> like so essentially he has these five hypotheses and then um but he argues that they're two separate and distinct things that will eventually meet but you can't really expect it. I think Vygotsky, who is a Soviet, he, he was a very famous Soviet sociologist, I believe, and he, he was just leagues ahead of his time. Like, this man was a genius. And uh, he dies in 1934 of tuberculosis. And Stalin. 34. In 1934, yeah. I thought wow. he might have been purged. So I was like, I was <laughs> Google checking myself. I was like, was I right? No, I was wrong. No. All right. We're just going to we're just going to go with it. But um Let's assume. Let's assume he's whispering. Right, right. Tuberculosis, what is that? Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> code name. Code name, yeah. Um but anyway, like he's he's after his death, um he's kind of promoted as this premier Soviet linguist and he believed in these three steps of integration between this L1 process of psychological imitation to our environment and the L2 process of discerning meaning. And he calls that the zone of proximal development. <laughs> and that these two will eventually collide. And second language speakers, multilingual speakers, especially if they're using English as their, their additive language, it doesn't even have to be their second. They experience a lot of issues because they're just... Not so much like they don't understand the grammar of it, but it's more of like the American or the Western concepts of society that are put into our words. So like definitely. You, yeah, definitely. And um, so often we're having to teach students not so much like and it's kind of becoming a little bit of a revolution, I think, in our in our field, if you if you can call linguists revolutionists in the sense that we're trying to change the way we view um, standard language. So we're talking about a lot like with common tongue and Valyrian. It's a lot of, you know, different things. So how can we like distinguish like which one is like the most important one, right? And that's what we call the standard. The revolution in linguistics is that we're trying now to teach the colloquial, the, the realistic, things that occur in like actual speech versus things that you were probably drilled at in school. One of my favorite um, things uh, was this, I, I can't even remember the comedy that it came from, but Andy Kaufman was playing this immigrant character, taxi driver, he doesn't speak any, any English, has like this like little book with him. And he's like, hey, like I learned like three words today. Thank you, have a good day, how are you? You know, and the guy's like, what are you talking about? And he like flips to the back and there's like an appendix. And he's like, here, here's all the words that you need. Get off my back, you know, like get out of my way, you know. I just thought like, that's so interesting that like 
all language books are constructed like this. They all have, if you remember any, every single one that I had, it was like, yeah. how are you? My name yeah. is Marsha. I wear a white shirt, you know, but then like in the back, it was like, yeah. you know, oh, hey, where's, uh, where's Marsha going after, you know, school today? Or like, you know, hey. where are all the cool spots at? Or, I don't know. <laughs> and like the first thing that, 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 that people who live where you go teach you is like curses and just like, right yeah, that kind of stuff okay so so you are bilingual right yes yeah well i i i don't know like um would you can you said yours yes yeah i do but i i i'm very particular i'm in the middle of like my journey of that so when i say like bilingual mm. i think a lot like in english but i interact a lot with german so like my computer settings are in german uh my phone settings are in german And um, I talk to my mom and my dad sometimes. But there's other instances where, like, if I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm going to think in English. It's, it's okay. just it's something I can't help. So, so just like to give background, so you were raised partly in, uh, in Germany. You're not just weirdly right. sp- speaking in German and having your settings in German for no, <laughs> no reason. No, no, no. I had to. <laughs> right. I had to be exposed yeah. to it. And it's a really, like, unique kind of story in that sense. Just when we moved over there, um, We, we had a really big family. That's why I'm saying like so many sociological factors play into how one like learns and acquires another language. Because when we moved over there, just my family, we're a really big family. My, my mom and my dad are just very open, you know, happy people. So when we moved there, everybody was really receptive to us. And we really assimilated ourselves into our village's culture. And we're really embraced by that. But with a lot of speakers of other languages that doesn't happen you know you try your best and you're kind of dejected you're rejected. rejected sorry you know yeah and it doesn't always like succeed in that sense I, th- I think there are a lot of interesting uh, differences between hebrew so my first language was my first languages were actually hebrew and greek i forgot greek i was born in athens and uh, until the age of three but i forgot it And then I learned English, but we moved again to Brussels, to Belgium. So my French overtook my, my Hebrew. I remember one time, I will never forget that day. I was sitting with my brother and I started to think in French. And that was so weird. But then we came back to Israel and then again my English, because English is everywhere. So my English now is better than my French. And I find myself, first of all, so when I go to whatever, the U.S. and I interact to, uh, in English yeah. for a long time, I can feel my head... thinking differently because english is much more circular than hebrew that is very direct very succinct two three words like whenever yeah. you translate something from english to hebrew you lose uh 40 of the amount of words that you need and, and if you try to speak to translate directly from hebrew to english then you just are very very rude It's, it's very, very rude. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to okay. like reprogram yourself when you switch over to, to another language. Right. And maybe if we go back to the story and we go back to the conclusion for Daenerys. <laughs> she didn't really try to do it at least from what we see right in the in the show she was just like i'll i'll do the same thing that i did up to now in essos it worked for me so i'm gonna do the same thing here and it's gonna work right and i think like that's not so much like a fault of daenerys is that that's just a fault in us all that we're always going to try and conform the the acquire the learn language to Our first we're always going to try there's always like this interstasis of inner language or trans languaging where you're compromising your two processing systems because like you're saying it's a reprogramming of how your mind's working you're going from one mode to another so it's not so much like a fault of hers in that so much you have to like look at the people around her if you want to understand her failures and it's like who did she go to <laughs> who was her feedback who was her source of Um, of second language use and I have to think it had to be Jorah he, he was just one of the most low-key powerful people in the entire Ooh. story and it was just such a surprise to like think about that yeah Sir Jorah I, I don't know how to say thank you in Dothraki there is no word for thank you in Dothraki give me your water Alicia this man has been sentenced to death yeah because if you if you go back and you reread it and a lot of like her scenes in Karth and in 
uh, before they even reach Karth. Anytime, like, when they're in the Dothraki Sea, she's always, like, dispatching Jorah to go do it. Because she's like, no, Jorah, you're, like, the only one who can speak. Not just, like, the language, but you're the only one who can talk to the people on the docks. Like, you're the only one that they can relate to. I think Daenerys, like, first failed to connect with the small folk. So if you really, like, wanted to get into the nitty gritty, I think it was ultimately her and Tyrion's failure to not properly propagandize her, her, her return. If I were Varys, if I were Tyrion, I would have been sending out mass tweets all the time, like all forms of communication. Maybe even slowly like blend it into um, Valyrian and it could be like supposedly like the language of the free or something. Right. I don't know. This is this is just gross invasion tactics yeah. 101. Yeah. Like, but we're not above that. We're not above that. Let's do it. I'm saying that like <laughs> if you were to somehow like amass the people right. to your side, you could do so linguistically by like adhering to this, like we said before, the oppressed oppressor dichotomy of just right. like the common tongue is the language of your oppressor. We are going to give you the language of, you know, the liberator, right. you know. She could say I am both. I am both. I speak the common tongue right. like you, but also I have the, the Targaryen Valyrian side. We're going to do a repair of the, of the Targaryen break that we've had with my father. This would be like the repair. We're going to build something new that is more uh, organic or something like that. <laughs> you could always like try to bring the zone of proximal development together to a point of melding. But if you don't meet those like like very specific like temperatures it's gonna just completely fall apart and right. disband i've always like thought of an interesting linguistic situation was the moment before she decides to go to king's landing so before i saw the behind the scenes and before they had to explain themselves i thought it was pretty interesting how um because i like i've never watched any episode more than i've watched the bells probably just to try to like understand what was going on and one of the points I thought was most interesting was Daenerys's very fast code switching. And just, yeah. it was so interesting because a lot of uh, my friends um, in the linguistic community and just like um, friends in my, in my Game of Thrones community, um, especially my friends of color, they were just kind of like, that's so weird that like she would want to like switch it over that way. And I think that that's just like a writing convenience, but the code switching is a very like, interesting part of Daenerys's dynamic because she can go automatically you know you you know as the viewer that something's off if like you know she sees John she knows only you know she knows John's monolingual so she turns and she's just like go do this like it's not even to like say anything explicit it's just to give John the implicit idea of like yeah. this is you are so stupid like and uh, like honestly that's what made me so frustrated about how fast that she fell because it fed into the whole fear love uh the machiavellian principle you know and i think machiavelli really understood the importance of not just like standard in your national language but standard in your dialect too because he was a prince from Flo or no yeah. not a prince yeah. he wasn't a prince but he served the princes of of, of florence but he could understand the importance of growing up in like one area. So I like another interesting uh, person to look at, though she might be monolingual, is Cersei, because she acquires two different dialects. She has her her native Casterly Rock Westerland okay. dialect, probably that she would have grown up with, and then she's brought to court at yeah. a very young age, at you know twelve or thirteen. It shares similarities with Sansa's journey as well. Right, right. I was thinking about that, yeah. Tell me the truth. Do you want an end to this engagement? I am loyal to King Joffrey, my one true love. And so you can connect these two characters as, like, essentially, like, they're, they're, both of their journeys are, um, they understand, like, the standard, but now that they are in King's Landing, they have to learn the dialect of, like, King's Landing, Lord's, or, like, Grace's common tongue, you know, like... The, the common tongue that you would only speak in the Red Keep on, you know, the the seventh day when the sun is shining and, you know, Joffrey. <laughs> but you know what? It, it, it reminds me of the first uh, Sansa POV chapter in A Game of Thrones. Yeah. And it seems as if she 
knows this language as if her mother tongue is this and this is where i can say that i think she should have been queen right that her her nature yeah. she speaks it she she doesn't speak the northern kind of uh, of language like aria right. she speaks like the southern way she she's like very good with the curtsy and with the barristan selmy and with renly and with the cersei she knows how to speak right. like this royal court uh, language that i it's not really clear how she would have uh, like she, she she's basically a natural a natural she can boom 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 she can pick this up and, you know she can observe and she knows exactly what to say whereas like aria can't aria aria refuses mm. you know she's brought in kicking and screaming mm. and then they're like oh look at her she's so wild right. you know she's as wild as her wolf you know and she's just like completely incompetent but then again like she's never seen focusing in her studies with the septon up there and she it's described that aria is the most stark like of of Ned's right. true-born children. And I, I think, too, that's you bring up a really interesting parallel where you have to also consider in language development kind of the lineage of, like, of hereditary in a way. So it's like you kind of don't control your fate oh. <laughs> as far as, like, how many languages you learn. Right. That's kind of dependent on what you're yeah. exposed to. And that exposure is dependent upon your parents' experiences or your caregivers' experiences. So whoever's providing all this feedback for you also has to, like, exhibit some sort of ability or, like, you know, processing themselves. So, like, for instance, I don't, I don't think you would have ever been able to really, like, learn French or, like, concretely, like, synced it in without these critical um, interpersonal yeah. interactions that you would have. Especially, like you were saying, it was with you and your brother, too, when, like, such a connection was mm -hmm. made. And... Oftentimes, like, I, I feel very connected with my sisters when I'm speaking German to them. It's really fun, especially, like, you know, if you're, like, out and about and you're, like, in play, you can just kind of, like, uh -huh. you know, ah, ah. it's like, oh, what does that word mean? Oh, it's, like, it's just a German it's word. It's a secret it's language. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, secret, uh -huh. secret, secrets. <laughs> secrets. So Arya, then she goes to the, to the House of Black and White. And there, there's right. also, like a, like, a totally separate language. Right. She has to learn it all over again. And I think this time it's like more, it's like, it's actually visceral. And the writing in it is so good because like she's made blind, right? So she's blind. She can't see. A lot of linguists, especially those in phonetics and phonology. So real quick, phonetics is broad, you know, understanding of sound systems. Phonology is like one very specific. So like Hebrew is a good uh, case for phonology because... Um, I, it, by my understanding in your morphology and your written word, you omit every yeah. vowel, right? When no you're vowels. writing. Yeah. And no vowel, but it's enunciated yeah. and you pronounce it like when right. you're speaking. You have like, uh, like dots and stuff, like punctuation, but nobody uses the punctuation. So you just have to infer from the, remember. yeah, remember, exactly. Remember. I think that's something akin to like what Arya is going through with learning. It's like she's having to develop this extra sense mm -hmm. of, you know, language learning, kind of like that, where she has to infer meaning and rely on it, you know, to, to build her interactions with the world. She's like touching everything. She's probably like smelling everything, trying to do it. So the, the experience of it must be so much more, you know, she must be the most amazing bilingual speaker ever you know because she's she would have had to have gone through this complete reprogramming of her brain to to learn this other language in a way i think it's a really brilliant plot point martin uses the blindness and her sight in the books not in the yeah, not yeah, in the yeah, show yeah. for me but yeah. like it, but i mean it goes to show in the show too and it's why i guess like the character aria doesn't really why, why it kind of fails to develop you know after after season six yeah but, hey, so, so, so in the books. Yes, and then so in the books, like there's this, like extra level of of learning. And she's putting faces of other people, so she has to speak, like other people from different backgrounds. She has to. Yeah. Ooh, wow. Mm. Fun. That's fun. Oh. Linguistics is fun. Yeah, it's it's freaky, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, just... so we have to do another one. We have to do another one because okay. this is already like forty minutes long. I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. We have to yeah. do another one. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Very good job, Mallory. Very yeah, good job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So thank you, Mallory. No this has been super interesting. If you enjoyed this conversation, you want to share it in your social platform, or you want to send it to your friends, you want to tell somebody. That was a lot yeah. of fun. Yay. All Yay. Right, let me Mission see. accomplished. Mission accomplished. We did it, gal. Yay. All right. Hey, everybody. I want to thank Mallory for this insightful conversation. And I want to thank you for listening in all the way to the end. Okay, so if you're here, it means that you like this conversation, that you like this channel. So I would like to humbly ask you to maybe share it with your friends on social media, on Reddit. Maybe you're active uh, on the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit or another Song of Ice and Fire forum. That would be a big help, would give me motivation to post as many of these as possible. And obviously it will pay off big time when the Winds of Winter will come out sometime next year, maybe. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, patrons, for supporting our work. And I'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody.